Now, the first thing you need to remember, and I needed to remember this or to learn it, is in the 16th and 17th centuries, when you went before a court of law, you were presumed guilty until the contrary was established. It was not innocence presumed until guilt was established. It was exactly the opposite. Inquisition, British common law, every law, Roman law, that was the basic principle. Okay? So the Inquisition was based on accusation. I accuse you. I accuse you before the Inquisition of heresy. I've seen you eat something differently. I've seen you draw the curtains on the Saturday <coughs> and celebrate the Sabbath. That's supposed to be on Sunday. Or I've seen you refusing pork. Stuff like that. Now, that can mean that someone is a converser or sliding back into Judaism. It can also mean that I don't like you. And I'm just getting, I'm getting at you. Okay? The Inquisition doesn't make successfully a distinction between those two cases. It's a difficulty every justice system has at that time. You are denounced. Step number one, assumption of guilt. Step number two, the charge against you is examined in private without your knowledge. How do you like that? You don't even know you've been denounced, you've been spoken about, and a case has been built up against you. A tribunal sits and it decides whether we can go with this or not. If they decide that we can, a man called a fiscal or prosecutor requests your arrest. The Inquisition decides if there is plena provenza, if there is, you're arrested, your goods are confiscated, and you are imprisoned. And you are brought before the Inquisitors three times, and you are asked a simple question. Is there anything you have been doing about which you might feel the least little bit guilty? And you're not told who has accused you, you're not told what you're accused of. And the Inquisition works basically by establishing the coherence between what you say and what has been said about you. And if you know what to say to disarm what's been said about you without knowing what's been said about you, you will be freed. If you don't, you are in serious trouble. Particularly if you are <coughs> careless with the truth or if you have an imagination and if you get lonely in prison and begin to go mad as many people did, you are really in trouble. Because of one thing the Inquisition can cope with, that is mitigating circumstances. The fact that you had a sad childhood, or that your parents didn't understand you, or that you had a pet who died early in life. The Inquisition can take account of that and can <coughs> explain your current behavior in terms of a past misfortune. Okay? So it's strictly the coherence between what you say and what the Inquisitors have in a book before. Okay? Formal accusation is made against you. You can decide to defend yourself if you want. The communication of proof, the charges are read, the witnesses are vetted, are vetted. the witnesses are heard, not by you, but by the judges. The charge is accepted, and then there's a great occasion called El Falio, which is the vote. And that's the sign of what's going to happen to you. Are you guilty, or are you not guilty? And to help things along, torture is permitted. Torture is permitted. Okay. So just to help people along, to see the way to the truth. And I've seen it as a good thing because it helped people focus. <laughs> <laughs> it helped people focus on the truth of their misdemeanors. Okay, so very, very different idea to torture what we have. There are three possibilities. You can be absolved. Your case can be suspended, that doesn't mean you're hung, it just means it's suspended for another time. Or you can be sentenced. Now what does absolve mean? It's the Catholic term absolved from sin. It doesn't mean that you're let go. It means that you recognize your sin, you're absolved and punished and let go. Suspended means we don't really have enough on you now, but hang around and we may. <coughs> the sentence is, you have refused to admit your guilt, which we have established. You will now be sentenced. And what would you be sentenced to? 
if you weren't that much of a sinner or a backslider, just monetary and spiritual penances, like the confiscation of all your property, stuff you can easily get over. <laughs> you can abjure the Levi, which is of light things, or of the vehementi, of very, very serious things. Now, if you're abjuring the Levi, you're going to get off with just a light penance. But I'm afraid if it's the vehementi, you're not going to go to the, not to the state, but you're going to be garroted and burned. Okay. Now, confessed, if you confess, you're integrated and forgiven with the punishment. Okay. However, if you remain negativo e contuman, as it's called, in other words, you refuse to admit that you're guilty, you are questioned again, and you are, I love the phrase, relaxed to the civil arm, relajado, which means you are handed over to the civil arm to be executed. Why? Because the church can't execute you. And you see the nice Latin tie. Ecclesia, church, abhorrent, is horrified as sanguinate by blood. The church can't execute, can't commit corporal punishment. That has to be done by the state. So many of the bishops could carry around maces and could batter your head off, but they couldn't carry a sword which would actually shed blood. I'm not telling complete lie in this <laughs> Now, if you are sentenced, whether it's to a punishment or to death, you have to go through a public event called the auto de fe, which you may have heard of. And that is the public pronouncement of your will. And I have a lovely picture here of an auto de fe <coughs> in Madrid in the late 17th century. And you are brought onto a platform which is a representation of the last judgment. With the king and the priests and the inquisitors, with the angels, and you as the guilty, with the devils and the demons. Okay? Now, those who are punished <coughs> are punished, sent to the galleys, they're properly confiscated, whatever. The rest, I'm afraid, are given over to the civil arm and they're executed in a different place, not here, in a different place, in secret, okay? And you trust your soul then completely to the mercy of God, all right? Now, that's the general thing. I finally got to what I want to talk about after only two quarters of an hour. The Irish naturally appear in the records of the Spanish Inquisition. Why? Because from 1580, the Irish are moving in considerable numbers into Spain. Why? Because there is a civil war in Ireland, a religious war in Ireland, and there is economic want in Ireland. <coughs> Peace, the possibility of prosperity, and a place to realize dreams which you can't follow in Ireland. Now, I have come across 128 cases involving Irish people in the Inquisition. From the mid 16th to the early 19th century, 111 of them involved men, which doesn't surprise anybody, <coughs> 14 women, and three reported books of publications, in other words, a censorship of books. Interestingly, the geographical distribution of them three in Lima, eight in Mexico, one in Caracas, the remainder in Spain, and the majority of them are in the tribunal in Madrid, in the Corte where the Irish tended to congregate. No surprise, over 70 of them are accused of Lutheranismo, of being Protestants. In other words, Catholics who had fallen into Protestantism, or Catholics who said they were Catholics but who were really Protestants. Okay, 70 of them, which is a lot, considering the Irish are supposed to be Catholics. All right. 14 accused of having prophecy only. <coughs> Basically, that was saying unwise things in a pub, or heard by somebody who didn't like you, and reported to the inquisitors. A few cases of all, they're very funny and very tragic at the same time. Do not drink heavily and get into theology. It's extremely <laughs> Eight of them, eight people I identified as Irish, are not victims of the Inquisition. They actually work for it as familiares or as officials. The Irishman did at all levels, as usual. 
One Irish man was accused, believe it or not, of his Lamismo. Okay, and he was in Barcelona. I think he was captured by Barbary pirates, brought to Africa, brought back to Spain, and was accused then of maintaining the ways of Islam, even though he was supposed to be Catholic. Poor fellow. One case of confessional solicitation, you know what that is. One case of intrusion in a confession, which means somebody within a confession pretending to be a priest, and they weren't, basically. And only one case of fornication, which I'm sure is a gross underestimation <laughs> and a misrepresentation of the amorous talents of the Irish. <laughs> now, a few examples of these Lutherans, okay? The Irish were unfortunate to be associated with England, okay, which is one of the great constants in Irish history. <laughs> but you will see here how it actually did work out, in fact, to be a bad thing. John Hawkins, you may have heard of him, is an English pirate supported by Queen Elizabeth and sent over to Mexico to sow mayhem in the Spanish provinces because England is at war with or preparing for war with Spain. He was captured with his crew by the Spaniards, and they were all tried. Why? England is only Protestant friends since 1570, when Queen Elizabeth was excommunicated. So it's assumed everybody in England is it? Is a Catholic. So this boatload of Protestants comes in. Of course they have to be tried, because the accusation is that they're all <coughs> Catholics pretending to be Protestants, and Protestants pretending to be Right. Now they were all into Veracruz, among them inevitably are Irish. And we know one of them very well, he's a fellow called John Martin, he's from Cork in the south of Ireland, and we have a delicious, complete file of him, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about later. And it's very, very good. Okay. So he's one, and look how early that is, 1574. We have another process of the favourite case involving a man called David Nyland, or Neelan, 1587. And we know he's from Limerick, <coughs> and we learn from his record that he's living in Madrid in the house of the Bishop of Limerick, which is in Ireland. What the hell is the Bishop of Limerick doing in Madrid? The Inquisition records reveal a whole lot of details which have nothing to do with the Inquisition at all. all right. Ricardo Martinez, who had converted himself to Lutheranism, to Christianity, Duarte Hewitt, this is an interesting guy, look at him. He's not Irish at all, he's English. 1620, but the Irish connection is this guy, Eugene McCarthy, or McCarthy. And what's he? He's a priest, he's Irish, he's living in Madrid. And he has been teaching Duarte to say his prayers. In other words, he's converting him to Catholicism. Okay? And the Inquisition wants to establish, is the Englishman's conversion real? And of course, Carty has to be interrogated about that. All right? And we have Guillermo <coughs> Morphe, you see how he's spelled? M-O-R-F-E, or M-O-R-F-I, Murphy is his name. And be very careful <coughs> in Spanish archives because there's frequently Irish people masquerading as, as Spaniards, with <laughs> Spanish-style versions of their name. Okay? And look what he did, Murphy 7010. He is an official of the Spanish government in Cuba. And what's he been doing? I'm afraid he's been up to something very nasty according the Inquisition. He has been in contact with an Englishman called Alexander Smith. And he has reunited Alexander Smith with his child, who has been taken away from him to be re-educated. And the Irish guy who's supposed to be on the side of the re-educators has spirited the child back to his parent. And of course, is before the Inquisition for his loyalty. Okay. Doctrinal and social discipline. That was the second heading under which the Irish came before the Inquisition. Okay. Assassinations, <coughs> murders, all sorts of public disorder. These things came before the Inquisition as well. The Irish can be riotous, and there are some of them coming out there. I will run on quickly to officers of the Inquisition. Who were they? Irish people, well placed in the Spanish administration, 
who were part of the apparatus 